Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Klein, Senior Vice President of Welt Tower and Chair of the 2015 Medical Real Estate Investment Forum. Good morning. Well, a handful of years ago, who would have thought we'd be sitting here in this beautiful venue in Colorado discussing data? But to quote W. Edwards Deming, in God we trust, all others must bring data. Good morning, I'm Dan Klein, Senior Vice President of Well Tower. And on behalf of Revista, I want to welcome you to Revista's second annual Medical Real Estate Investment Forum. My purpose here today is to kick off our exciting conference. And what you don't know is that all of the speakers got together and decided to lead with me, so everybody had a nice low bar over which to jump for the rest of the day. I'll talk about two things. Number one, the importance of Revista's work and its implications for all of us. And number two, how Revista is progressing in its mission. Now that I've laid out what I'm gonna talk about, let's head into the importance of Revista's work. Medical real estate has grown into an accepted asset class with a total market value of over $340 billion. A sector that significant cries out for serious data analytics. At last year's Revista launch, we discussed the overwhelming need for a medical real estate database. That was just one year ago. As the medical real estate space exploded before our eyes, the need for reliable data grew and it wasn't until the creation of Revista that we finally found our source for reliable, unbiased, and comprehensive medical real estate data. This is important to all of us because data helps support our belief that medical real estate is evolving into a viable core asset class. Other sectors have independent data collection and reporting. Medical real estate is and will be held to that same high standard going forward. This speaks to the importance of Revista's work. Let's move on now to how Revista is progressing in its mission. Revista's initial mission was to be a complete resource supporting the industry's medical real estate decisions. Revista wanted to provide focused healthcare real estate data, industry information, and networking opportunities. In just two years, Revista has compiled a database of over 37,000 medical and hospital properties totaling more than 2.8 billion square feet. I'm going to say that again because of its significance. 37,000 properties, 2.8 billion square feet just in the last two years. They've published 100 plus reports related to transactions, construction projects, and market overviews, hosted five webcasts, and much, much more. To just name a few, Revista's data can be used to drive and support decisions for specific opportunities, to better understand a market, and to help keep a pulse on industry trends. I've touched briefly on why Revista's work is important and how they're doing on their promise to all of us. Thank you for your time and interest today. We hope you leave today's conference having acquired a few benefits the opportunity to network with new and familiar faces, an energized view of relevant industry topics, and the access to data to support your ongoing medical real estate efforts and decisions. Today's conference will focus on connecting relevant session content with applicable data. And while we all enjoy coming together at these conferences, networking, and engaging in, in these kinds of business meetings, today's conference really highlights the power of the data. And that's what makes this different, and that's why 
uh, we are supporting Revista in the manner that, that we are. In closing, I'd like to personally thank Alyssa and Hilda and Mike and Jim and the entire Revista team for their dedication, determination, and diligence in pursuing what is a, a very worthy goal. It, it's a pleasure to work with them and, uh, and the entire advisory board. I'd also like to quickly thank one of our Well Tower team members, Libby Langendurfer, for all of her hard work on behalf of Revista. And with that, I would like to introduce Hilda Martin, principal with Revista. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dan. I'd like to give a big thank you to Dan for chairing this event. Um, also want to thank Well Tower for their platinum partnership, and they are the sponsor of this general session this morning. Here we go. Right. At a station in Baltimore, an old lady boards a bus to Boston and sits herself directly behind the driver. She asks him to let her know once they arrive at Newark. She gets settled, they take away. About 10 minutes into the ride, she asks the driver, are we at Newark yet? 10 minutes later, same question, are we at Newark yet? Driver keeps on replying, no, not yet lady, but I'll let you know when we get there. This continues for hours and the driver gets more and more frustrated. And finally, he sees the station for Newark coming up. He pulls over slams on the brakes, opens the doors and said, lady, this is where you get out. Is this Newark? Yes, get out. Oh, well, I'm, I'm staying all the way till Boston. My daughter told me to take my blood pressure medication when we reach Newark. As you can see, the bus driver came to conclusions based on the information available to him, and he assumed that she would be getting off at Newark, only to find out when they arrived that this wasn't the case. She would be staying on that bus all the way to Boston. So today, let's start off by taking a look at some information that's already available to us, things that we hear about all the time that could be driving demand in medical real estate, things that sort of suggest that there's a tailwind behind the sector. Then, let's take a look at the Revista data and see if this is actually coming into play. Is construction up? Is deal volume up? So the demand drivers we're gonna talk about fall into three categories. Not figure this thing out. All right, the first is the aging demographic and the effects of the ACA on insured. Hospital and system movement out into the community and away from the campus, and then the favorable capital environment. So before I jump into the first one, let's talk about what's already existing in the market. Many of you know that about a year ago, Revista came out with the first database of medical properties. We track everything from medical office buildings, surgery centers, urgent care, hospitals, uh, we even track office buildings that have a lot of medical tenants and retail buildings that have a lot of medical tenants. For the purpose of the presentation today, though, we're looking at strictly medical, so it must be completely medical in the building, and that's medical office buildings and hospitals. We've got about 32,000 medical office buildings in our database and about 5,400 hospitals. And as Dan said, that's a total of 2.8 billion square feet. So that's what we're working with. All of that adds up to about $925 billion in value. We come up with a value by looking at average price per square foot and then applying that across inventory. So this inventory that we have, you know, you always see the gorgeous buildings, uh, the ones that just opened, it's in marketing, it's in articles, I mean the first a slide in this presentation had a picture of a gorgeous new building, but a lot of the inventory doesn't look like that. So if we take a look at the makeup of this inventory, got a chart here looking at all the buildings that we track uh, and bucketing them by when they opened. So 63% of the properties that we track were built before the year 2000. 
When we went through and researched all of these properties, we'd have a researcher get a visual on it and determine whether it was class A uh, or a class B or C. And about 476 million square feet was deemed class B or C. So we have some aging inventory that's part of that 2.8 billion. So the first demand driver, let's start with the Affordable Care Act. I feel like every conference and pretty much every session you'll hear somebody reference the ACA and its effect on our industry. Let's talk today just about how that might affect space in our industry. So looking back to 2013, before the first open enrollment, we look at the total amount of inventory at that time compared to the total number of insured population. So for every insured person at that time, there was 4.8 square feet of space. From October 2013 to September of this year, 15.3 more, 15.3 million more people are insured. That's net anyone who lost insurance. Now buildings opened in 2014 and buildings have opened in the beginning of this year. So if we look at our current inventory, we look at the current number of insureds, we're at 4.58 square feet for each insured. Now I know you're looking at me and saying, Hilda, what, what is that, 0.22 square feet in difference? I mean, we're talking pretty small here. But when you look across the entire insured population, you're talking about a gap of 62 million square feet. So we would have to add 62 million square feet of medical office space to reach that 4.80 square feet per insured. That's just under 5% of our existing inventory. So this seems like a tailwind on our sector, and it seems like that this would suggest we need more space. There's a lot of other things going on, obviously, but this is, this is one driver of demand. The other part of this one, and these both tie into utilization of healthcare services, is the aging demographic. So this is a chart of uh, the 65 plus population, and I'm so sure that no one in here has ever seen this chart. This is breaking news. Anyway, the millions of times I looked at this chart, I always look at the, the end of it, the, the peak of it, and I see the years 2040 and 2050, and I think, gosh, that's, that's so far away. But look at the decade that we're in now. Look at, look at 2010 to 2020. Now you've got about 15, 15 million uh, people will turn 65 in the decade that we're in. So to compare, I mean, we're adding 15.3 million insured. Now that's over a much shorter time frame. But there's 15 more folks, 15 million more folks that will turn 65. And this is important because as we age, we utilize more healthcare services. So utilization of healthcare services by age here, we're looking at each age group and the percentage of that group that sees a doctor four or more times per year. So young adult and kids under 18, it's about a quarter of that population that sees a doctor four or more times per year, and as you age, that goes up. When you get past 65, that's 66%, so the majority of that group sees a doctor four or more times a year. And this all suggests that we're gonna need more space to serve this population. So that's the first driver of demand. Let's move on to the second one, and that is the movement of hospitals and systems out into the community. This one you hear about all the time, too. You can't go to a conference without hearing something about the retailization of healthcare. And there's a million reasons why a hospital or a system would want to move out into the community. They want to build their brand, get more people seeing their brand, build their market share. Uh, one of the trends that we hear about a lot is hospitals acquiring physician practices. So this is a chart from the American Hospital Association, and it's showing the number of physicians and dentists employed by a hospital. And you can see, starting in around 2002, 2003, that really starts to pick up, and through 2013, that's about a 56% increase. 
So if you acquire a physician practice, you automatically have some sort of space around that physician practice's patient base. You want to keep them around that patient base so you can get the referrals. If you have several physician groups and specialties, maybe you want to build out there and get all of those groups under the same roof. Uh, it's a demand factor for building away from the hospital campus. So patient convenience and cost are two really big factors. And in order to take a look at this one, I'm honing in on one particular product because there's some data available on it, and that's retail clinics. So retail clinics you're going to find in a Walgreens or a CVS. Uh, they even have them in Walmart now. And they can handle a variety of cases, a sprained ankle, of the flu, um, sinus and, uh, infection, anything like that. And here you're looking at those same types of cases and the cost based on the setting. So first is retail clinic. It's the cheapest out of all of them at $110. Uh, physician office in urgent care at 166 and 156. You go to an emergency department that goes up all the way to 570. So retail clinics from 2006 to 2012 went from 200 of them to 1,800 of them and went from one and a half million visits to over 10 million visits. So there's been a lot of growth with this product type. Some of it could be cost, a lot of it could be convenience. I always consider myself to be like most of the population, so I thought, hey, let's take a look at me. Let's take a look at my house. So this is my house in the center here, good old Pasadena, Maryland. And here's the closest hospital to me, Baltimore Washington Medical Center. I would have to get on a highway. It would take me 15 minutes if there's no traffic to reach that hospital. Uh, I don't know about around you guys, but the hospitals around us, if you go to the emergency room, you're making a time commitment. So I think the times I've been there, it's three, four hours, sometimes more before you, you get in and get out. A retail clinic doesn't have that kind of timeline. Usually it doesn't have this kind of distance either. So I thought, let's take a look. Where are there retail clinics near my house? So let's see. These are all the retail clinics by my house. So there's CVS's, there's Walgreens, they're right down the street. If I had a case that I thought could be handled in a retail clinic, I would choose it for cost and convenience. And I think this will apply to a lot of other uh, ambulatory services uh, if they're closer to your patient. Another reason to keep moving out into the community is you want to keep your higher revenue cases at your hospital. You want to move anything you can to a less expensive setting. This is looking at hospitals, sur surgeries that happen at a hospital and the percentage that are done on an outpatient basis. So in 1993, 55% of surgeries were outpatient. Uh, in 2013, that rose to 66%. Now obviously we've had a lot of, uh, lot of things happen since 1993 that allow us to do more surgeries on an outpatient basis. But it seems like a chunk of these uh, could be moved to a less expensive setting, perhaps away from the campus. So all of this suggests that there would be a demand that people would be building away from campus, that they would be buying away from campus. So shortly we'll find out if, if that's actually happening. So third and last but not least, uh, the favorable capital environment. I'm not going to get too deep into this one because we've got an economic overview coming shortly from Sam Shannon, but we all know that interest rates are low. Uh, and we also have a chart here from the Mortgage Bankers Association showing that lending and originations in commercial real estate is up across all investment types. So CMBS, commercial banks, Fannie, Freddie, life companies, you can see in 2014, originations are up. And if we look at this favorable environment, you would think, okay, deal volume would be high. From these, these three demand drivers, you'd think that demand would be keeping cap rates compressed. Well, let's find out if this is actually happening. Mike Hargrave is going to come up and go over the latest Revista data and see if these trends are playing out. And here he is.
Okay, thanks Hilda. Um, did a great job outlining some of the really long-term cyclical, uh, not even cyclical, sort of long-term tailwinds that the industry's got kind of at its back. Um, and let's, let's take sort of the next few minutes and look into what kind of impact they're having on the medical real estate sector. Specifically, I'm gonna talk about three things. One, I'm gonna talk about um, some trends with regard to construction uh, on the MOB sector as well as the hospital sector. Uh, two, I'm going to talk about transaction pricing to see what sort of impact we're seeing uh, with regard to cap rates and price pricing uh, in, in particular. And then third, we're going to take a, a brief look in, in terms of some of the uh, fundamentals trends that we're looking at throughout the sector and seeing what sort of impact uh, some of these demand drivers are having on fundamentals. So let's go ahead and get started. So this is a graph that shows medical real estate construction uh, across uh, all of the states of the United States. Um, this uh, rolls up uh, the dollar value of all of the hospital and medical office construction that's either currently under construction or well enough along in planning that we can quantify uh, uh, the dollar value as well as the square footage uh, in each project as well as start and end times. So this is what we call our total pipeline. In all, it equals about $86 billion worth of construction value across the United States. Uh, every single state in the United States has got medical construction going on right now. Uh, some states more than others, as you can see. The blue states tend to be the, the higher uh, uh, amounts of construction dollar value-wise. The, the um, sort of tan states uh, have lower uh, amounts of construction. Uh, each state ranges from about a little under a billion dollars in construction value to over ten billion dollars. California has the most at eleven point eight billion dollars in construction value right now. Texas seven point seven billion dollars and New York six point nine billion dollars. Those are the three states that lead in terms of, of uh, overall construction right now. So construction is in every state. Um, when we look across the top 10 uh, metros, you can also see that the top 10 metros are, are very active. Um, this uh, graph rolls up the uh, 10 largest metro areas with the number of uh, medical office construction projects, again, total pipeline that are currently under construction or late enough in planning that we can quantify those metrics on them. Uh, the total square feet, and then the, uh, we're measuring the amount of square feet relative to the existing N uh, MOB inventory in that particular market. So you get a, a measure of construction relative to existing uh, inventory. And you can see that overall there's well over 11.3 million square feet in the top 10 metros that, uh, of MOB space that are under construction right now. That equals 3.3% of existing inventory. Uh, uh, across 116 different MOB projects in the top 10 metro, metro areas. Uh, New York has the most uh, by square footage, 3.1 million square feet. Uh, Washington, D.C., uh, the Washington, D.C. metro area has the most in terms of uh, construction relative to existing inventory at 6.8%. So um, top 10 metros, all very active. There's at least five projects that are under construction in every single one of the top 10 metros. Um, so this is obviously a, a, uh, an area of interest for uh, not only hospitals, but also uh, investors and, and uh, developers. This graph looks at uh, medical office completions. Uh, on the top you have uh, expected completions by square feet uh, on a quarterly basis, and on the bottom you have expected completions by dollar value uh, uh, on a quarterly basis in the bottom. And you can see that clearly the expected completions are expected to, to rise, um, but they're supposed to plateau over the next several quarters. We're going to be delivering somewhere in the range of 4.4 to 4.6 million square feet of medical office space each and every quarter for the next uh, several quarters. Um, in 2015, in all, we're expecting 15.6 million square feet of medical office space to complete across the United States. Uh, that's obviously up from previous years. 
Uh, but when you compare that against existing inventory, Hilda went over the existing inventory earlier of 1.3 billion square feet. That equals just 1.2 uh, percent growth off existing inventory. So the 15.6 million square feet equates to 1.2 percent uh, growth, which if you then compare that to some of the demand drivers that Hilda was going over, it's probably way underneath uh, the levels that uh, uh, some of those demand drivers suggest uh, across the, the sector. And this is a graph that, sh that shows uh, starts uh, by, uh, by on-campus, off-campus. Uh, the point of this slide is to show a couple of things. One is that most of the construction that we're tracking is, in fact, off-campus, somewhere in the range of uh, 80 to 85 percent each quarter is, is actually uh, off campus, uh, this this graph rolls up construction starts on a on a uh, a rolling four quarter average basis. So it's a, it's the average each quarter, uh, trailing 12 months rolled rolled over the past uh, year or so. Um, and you can see that uh, recently we've been starting in excess of two billion dollars in va in construction value on the MOB side per quarter each and every quarter. Uh, when we look at that on a square footage basis, it equates to over 5 million square feet uh, a quarter on average on a rolling four-quarter basis. Um, if you sum that up over the last uh, uh, four quarters, we're starting over 20 million, uh, 20 million square feet worth of MOB space uh, uh, construction start-wise. That's in excess of the 15.6 million square feet that we're expecting to complete in 2015. So starts are outpacing completions right now. Um, this, this suggests that inventory is going to be rising at a little bit faster pace for the MOB, for the MOB space over the, next, uh, over the next year. Okay. Sorry about that. For some reason, my, my screen's not changing here. Um, okay, so construction is, is certainly rising. Completions are starting to rise a little bit. Starts are, are outpacing completions uh, in the MOB space right now. But when we look at who's driving the construction, clearly you can see that hospitals and health systems are really the ones that are driving the construction today in the MOB space or, or, or in the MOB world. Um, this slide looks at the, uh, the percentage of, of MOB stock by year built that is affiliated with a hospital or hospital system or not affiliated. So not affiliated is the blue, uh, the orange is affiliated. And clearly you can see that hospitals and health systems prefer the newer buildings. Um, over 80% of all of the MOB inventory built after 2009 is in fact affiliated. Um, this suggests that in excess of 80% of the, the new construction that's out there is being driven by hospitals and hospital systems as in, and is in fact affiliated. We see very few, we do see some, uh, but we see very few uh, purely speculative buildings built by developers. Um, most of the buildings that we, that we uh, 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 enter into our database are in fact sponsored by a hospital or a health system or in fact pre-leased to some extent, uh, 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 some extent. So very few are purely speculative buildings coming out of the ground. Okay, so that's, that's a run, roundup of construction. Um, we're going to talk next about some, um, and, um, although they're kind of trending somewhat flat over the last few quarters in our database. Um, back in 2012, cap rates were somewhere around 8% on the, on the medical office sector. Currently, they're trending around 68 and they've been like that for the past uh, uh, several quarters. So we have seen cap rate compression. If we, if we slice, this is on a, presented on a trailing 12-month basis. If we presented the raw quarterly values, you can see some more lumpiness. And really, that cap rate sort of took a, a real dive in the first quarter of 2015. I have a graph that shows the distribution of cap rates in a couple of slides from now, so we'll talk about that. 
Uh, when we talk about hospital cap rates, again, we've seen compression here as well. So back in uh, 2013, hospital cap rates were trending somewhere around nine. Uh, 2014, hospital cap rates, uh, the, the hospital cap rates are mostly lease yields that, that we catalog in our database. Uh, back in 2014, they were trending somewhere around eight. And most recently, hospital cap rates are trending around 7.5. So we have seen compression in the hospital real estate sector as well in our database, and we'll continue to monitor, uh, monitor this trend as well. Okay, so how, one of the key questions that we wanna get answered is, uh, number one, how, how are cap rates trending recently? And then number two, where are cap rates gonna go? I can answer the first question. Maybe Sam, can, Sam Chandon can help us with the second question uh, because he's, he's gonna give us a, a thorough review of some of the real estate finance trends. But when we look at how are cap rates trending recently, this is a graph that shows uh, the distribution of individual transaction cap rates trended from 2014 to present. Uh, so you can see that there's a fairly wide uh, distribution of cap rates, uh, but that the average works out to 6.8 uh, recently. Um, when we look at some of the recent trades that have happened, again, I mentioned earlier, but earlier in 2000, 